Okay, we're titling this section of our note slope intercept form. It should be on the page that is facing the foldable we made on Tuesday of finding slope from a graph, from an equation, and from a table. Why is this equation called slope intercept form? Again, because the m is equal to what? And the B is equal to the y, the y intercept. Hopefully you do have a book. If so, I would like you to turn. Sorry, I thought I had my book on my page. It's a page 57 in your book. If you look towards the middle of page 57, you will see a section that's titled Graph a Linear Equation. I'm not seeing all books open and I'd like to see them open. So we're going to use the equation that's right there on page 57 and we're going to use the steps and we're going to get them into our notebook. Why? As I've told you before and I will repeat it throughout this year, we do not just make these notebooks because I like to make notebooks. We make them as a resource for you when you get to Algebra 2. You will also even find some things in geometry next year you might look up in this notebook. Your high school teachers will expect you to remember the content from this class. And if you don't have memory of it, they're gonna expect you to have access to that memory. That's why we make these notebooks. We're gonna start off with number one. Step one, that is a really ugly number one I just wrote. Step one in our book says, identify the y-intercept in the equation. We're going to shorten that just to identify the y-intercept. The equation that we're looking at is the one from the page. It's y equals 4 over 5x plus 2. To the right of writing that equation, go ahead and use the graph paper and we're going to make a coordinate plane. And yes, I want you to put the arrows on the x and y axis every time you draw one to show that those x and y axes go on and on and on. What is the y-intercept in this equation? Two. two. So please write that b is equal to two. The second part of this step is not in our book. They just assume it. Put the y-intercept as a point on the graph. So it goes there. Step two's shorter version from the book. You can read it in the book, but we're going to write use slope to find a second point. I think it should say identify the slope from the equation because that's really what we're asked to do. We have to look at this equation and figure out what the slope is and then use it. What is the slope from this equation? Four over, five. four over five. And I really like that you guys said it that way. We had a conversation in second period because somebody said four fifths. 
You can see why they would look at it and think that true. It is not four fifths. Four fifths is a fraction. And that's when we're dealing with a part and a whole. And the whole it was something broken into fifths, right? This looks the same, but it's not a fraction. It is slope, which is rise over run. So our slope here is four over five, which is positive. When there's nothing in front of it, we know it's a positive slope. That means when I look at this point I put, my graph is gonna go in this direction because it's what kind of slope? If there was a negative sign in front of it, I would start picturing a graph that would go this way, right? So I'm gonna use this to find a second point. What does the four mean? I'm gonna rise up four or go down and I'm gonna run across how many? Five. So let's rise up four. And we're gonna run up, or run across five. Because it's a positive number, it's a positive slope, we've got positive four and positive five. That's important to think about as we start graphing things that are negative. Because both of these are positive, it's, they're both going in this direction. When you graph it, I will expect you guys to use a straight edge. It can just be a piece of paper. And you do not just connect the dots. You show that the line goes through those dots and goes on forever. And I went ahead before we even wrote step three. Step three. Sorry, should have done this before we drew it. Draw the graph through the two points. As long as you can put two points on a, a coordinate plane and you can draw a line through them, you can make the line that is that graph. With that, I'd like you to draw a line underneath that and we're gonna add a little bit more to our notes and then we're gonna do some practice problems together. The next thing we're gonna take notes on is slope formula. When I saw you on Tuesday and we found slope from a table, I had mentioned that there's a way of doing this without having a table. And it's called the slope formula. And I'm gonna put my pen down just for a quick second and let you know, I'm always in my head trying to remember what got me stuck in algebra. I've shared with you guys, and some of you joined this class later, so you may not have heard my math story. I did fine in math in middle school. I didn't take algebra till my freshman year of high school, and I did not understand it. Who's heard me tell the story before? Who has not? Yeah, there's a couple. So. I was in a regular math class and they took me out of that regular math class and they put me in what they called a math lab where I sat in a little booth and I was supposed to work at my own pace, which means I pretty much sat there and I read a book because I like to read. I did not get the math and I remember Mr. Ofeich, my teacher, patting me on the shoulder one day when I actually dared to ask him something and he told me a lot of girls aren't good at this. It was this shoulder, I remember. I didn't want him touching me, number one, and that was just rude to say. Did he believe I could do it? No. I am constantly revisiting all of that in my head, trying to remember what got me stuck, and this formula is one of the things that got me stuck. Now, Mr. Ofeich was a jerk. Let's set that aside. <clears throat> I was also growing up in a town that had a nuclear laboratory. I literally went to high school with friends whose parents graduated from Stanford, Berkeley, MIT, Harvard as math and science and physics majors. So, you know, I have to think about my, I never really thought about this until this year, but my math teachers in high school, 
if they were at parent teacher conferences the parents probably had more quality math education than they did as the high school math teacher so they were probably always thinking I've got to teach it straight up the way that these people learned it so I don't get in arguments with these really smart math science people who were my best friend in high school's mother had a patent on a laser in 1982 she created a laser and got a patent on in 1982 my dad sold like deodorant to drugstores like he never went to college so as I sat there thinking I couldn't learn this I really believe there are people who are good at this and then they have kids who are good at this because that's the kind of town I lived in can you guys get the dichotomy there this formula was one of the things that was a roadblock for me and it's really not that hard it looks hard though please write it down with me m equals what's m equal to it's our slope this is the formula I so want to go back to Mr. Ofa. I should be like, whatever, I teach this better than you did. And you thought I couldn't learn it. He didn't have a neck either. He must have been a grumpy man. His daughter was in my class and I saw her shoplift and get caught at the mall one time and I felt like, ha, 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 ha. Yeah, sorry, getting back into my childhood. So that looks confusing, doesn't it? What are all those little twos and little ones? All this means is that slope is equal to the change in y over the change in x. That's supposed to be a triangle, a delta. What do I mean by change? Look at what symbols here. What does a subtraction symbol find? It finds the difference, right? The difference is the change. Now think about the other day when you guys were finding this. We did it going from here to here. But if I said, what if you took this one and subtracted this one, you would have told me minus one, right? Going from here to here, it's plus one. It's still the difference, isn't it? It's the change that's happening. Now here's where I sort of forgive my high school math teachers. Because if I take this, which is in your book, negative one comma negative two, and three comma four. This is my X and this is my Y, true? And this is my X and this is my Y, okay? Now, they told me that I have to say, take the second ordered pair and put it in the formula here. And I have to take the first ordered pair and put it in the formula here. And my brain was already thinking, so what if you wrote this one down first and this one down second? What if I wrote this one down first and that one down second? Does it matter? And their answer was, this one second, you have to put it here. It is wrong. It's showing a very linear way of thinking about algebra instead of, algebra is actually pretty flexible. What this formula is saying is whatever this y is with in its ordered pair, its x has to be underneath. This y is with this x. So this negative two has to be over this negative one. That's all those little sub numbers mean. What's the y in the second ordered pair? And what's the x? They have to be over each other. This ordered pair is this one. This ordered pair is this one. What goes in between them according to the formula? Negative 2 minus 4 gives us what? I heard a couple people say it. Negative two minus four gives us negative six. Negative one minus three gives us negative four. Negative, four. negative divided by negative gives us positive. positive. And six divided by four. It's gonna be positive six over four, but it reduces to three over two. two. Oh. Oh. 
Now, according to my high school math teacher, we just did this wrong because we put the first ordered pair in the first place and the second ordered pair in the second place. Let's do it their way. Ready? Here's a second ordered pair. Four over three. The formula says minus. What's my first ordered pair? Negative two. Negative two. Why did I change that to a positive two? The formula has a negative and the ordered pair had a negative. Two negatives is a? Positive. So this formula has a negative, it's here. This ordered pair has a negative one, so it's going to become? Six over four equals three over two. Did we end up in the same place? Mm -hmm. So when I was asking, does it matter who wrote down which ordered pair in what order, and they told me it matters, does it matter? No. no. What matters is being careful with your negatives. What matters is making sure that when you put a Y in the formula, the X underneath it is from its same ordered pair. Those are the two things that matter with this. Is this challenging? Not really. Okay, so let's do a few problems together. I'm going to stop this and start a second.